generally speaking, I think there is a comic for everyone. Now, just because you don't like a comic or I don't like a comic doesn't mean that comic serves no purpose. Of course, you know, different comics are for different people. I think most people in their, I don't know, post 20s are probably not reading kind of Disney's Frozen. I, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, now, maybe, maybe there's some out there, but the, the, the general Venn diagram is going to be a much younger audience. So if comics are for everyone, I mean, let's take a look at that. Let's say what, what comics are these people for? And do we ever hit a place where comics just seem to be for, for nobody? Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, I think that generally comics, manga, whatever it is, it, it, there's generally an audience for being produced. Now, maybe that audience is very small, but I, I generally dislike kind of the argument of this comic was written for nobody or this comic was written for the for the writer. Because first off, uh, no comic is just produced by the writer. Well, wait, I'm sorry. Web comics and, uh, and personal published things, absolutely. Those can be vanity projects. It can be for just the writer. But if you're talking about anything produced by any kind of small, medium, large publisher, there's a lot of people involved in that. There's there's editors, there's there's people who selected this, there's there's a team. It's not just for one person. You know, people who didn't like Dan Slott's Iron Man, myself included, uh, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, that was written for Dan Slott. Well, yeah, except, you know, there are a bunch of people involved in that comic, including people I like. You know, I, I, I get along reasonably well with the editor for that comic, and yet... You know, it, it wasn't for me. So you try and kind of figure out who is this comic for? Now, I've beat up recently on, on clunky dialogue, and I think this is an infection that is really polluting a lot of comics. I think if you take a step back and you were to just re-script uh, many of the comics, you know, like, for example, if you take what, what Bendis is attempting to do over in Legion of Superheroes, I mean, you know, granted, the pace and what's going on with that comic is just moving at, like, Ice Age level speed. Uh, but if you if somebody came in and they just like, all right, we're going to wipe out all the, the, the wording in this comic, and we're going to rewrite, re-letter it, re-script it, and we're going to avoid kind of the weird, cutesy, I, what some people label Joss Whedon's type dialogue, just, just the, the dialogue that doesn't sound natural. I, I think there's a trap in comics where, and, and, and by the way, I want to point out, and I've done this before, uh, Chris Claremont, a lot of people revere his run, and I, I love his run. I think it is definitely an epic run in comics. However, if you read a lot of Chris Claremont, you would notice that the dialogue started to become clunky at times. He would reuse a lot of the same comments. He'd give phrases like, them's the breaks, and, and other things that just didn't feel completely normal. I, I mean, it's the best way to put it. It's just the dialogue sometimes was pretty clunky in his comics. Now, nowhere even remotely close to some of what we have today, but, you know, fair is fair. Some of that dialogue was clunky, and if you read it out loud and it sounds weird, it's weird. But generally speaking, this stuff appeals to someone. You know, I, I'm not a fan of much of Kelly Thompson's work, but that doesn't mean that she's a terrible writer, that she should be run out of comics. No, there's people who do like that type of dialogue, and, and there's a place for it. But if you pick up, say, West Coast Avengers, the run she did, you pick up Captain Marvel, you pick up Deadpool, you will notice uh, similarities. It's very much kind of been light in the sense that, you know, there's a, there's a similar way that the characters talk to each other. It's, it's quippy, but, but not good quippy. You know, like, I, I, I kind of roll my eyes at some of the the quippy dialogue that goes on in the Marvel movies, but you do get a sense that the screenwriters, the people producing that movie, probably spent a bunch of time in a writer's room really trying to get the best quippy dialogue they could get. It wasn't always great, but at least it it, it flowed fairly well. Um, I, I think, you know, in hindsight, you could look at that and be annoyed at kind of the Joss Whedonisms that would come out, things like The Avengers and, and other movies like that, but it's not, uh, you know, it... it it's not terrible. In comics, there really isn't that filter. Now, I may be wrong about this, and I'm, I'm trying to talk to as many editors as I can of all types to, you know, how are people getting in the, are, are, are people recommending changes? What's the level of kind of editing you're doing? 
And then when you get to somebody like, say, a Bendis or even, you know, Kelly Thompson, that somebody who has a number of books under their belt is, you know, the, the balance of power has tilted a little bit more to the writer. As an editor, you're going to go in and, and go to somebody like Jonathan Hickman, for example, and say, hey, this dialogue sucks. We're going to rewrite it here. This doesn't make any sense. Are you going to do that? Um, you know, you, maybe not. Unknown writer? Yeah, maybe. But you know, once, once somebody, like, who's going to do that to Bendis? Is Bendis going to pay attention to a single word that you say? If you come in and like, hey, you know what? This Legion of Superheroes comic, uh, we, we went out there, for your request, we went out there and we got uh, 22 different artists, you know, some pretty big name artists, and they all wanted to work with you, uh, Brian Michael Bendis. So, you know, we had uh, a different artist for every page of this book. And, um, you know, we couldn't help but notice that in some of these pages, you've then taken that art from some of these, um, you know, you got Liam Sharp in there and you've got, uh, you got all these kind of really strong artists and you plastered a bunch of words on top of that art. Like, uh, if, if, you know, if that was what you were going to do, you know, we, we would have just, you know, gone down to old Argentina and found an artist down there and, you know, thrown him onto this book. By the way, the last time I said something like this, somebody asked if I had something against uh, South American artists. No, no, not at all. In fact, I think South America has a, a really high percentage of, of great art talent coming out of there. I'm talking about the practice of going down to South America and basically offering pennies on the dollar to get work for cheap because you don't want to pay, you know, page rates in the U.S. That, that's what I'm referring to, not, not the people down there. Anyway, uh, but, you know, if, if you're going to just plaster words all over it, then, then maybe we wouldn't have paid for this. So... I, you get back to who's this comic for? And I think in some cases, there's comics being written for people who are not big comic fans, who are just wanting kind of light, breezy dialogue, maybe a little cutesy inside stuff. I think there's comics that are, and man, people are going to hate it when I say this, but comics written for cosplayers. So what I mean by that is comics written for people who are going to cons, and they're kind of interested in the environment of comics, but not necessarily the comics themselves. They just... They want their comics to be breezy and kind of, they want, they want people who buy from that audience. Again, that's not fair because there's a lot of different personality types, but I'm, I'm talking about the personality who wants to buy a comic that kind of sounds like what they read on Twitter or maybe kind of what their friends are doing. You know, it's, 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 they want that kind of, uh, you know, they don't really care if the comic continues or survives or anything else. There, there's comic fans out there who, they don't really, they go in, they just buy some comics based on what kind of looks interesting. This always would fascinate me, by the way, in a shop when the customers would come in and somebody would, they kind of browse and they'd pick up random comics. And I'd say like, Hey, you know, we have, you know, you're, I see you're buying issue number three of, uh, you know, Miss Marvel here. Would you like issue number two and issue number one? They're, they're still, I still got some at cover. They're right here. You just find, it's like, no, I like this cover best. So I, I'm going for this one. It's like, huh, but, you know, just so you know, this is like part three of a five-part story. Are, are you sure you don't want parts one and two? It's like, no, I don't care about any of that. Like, huh, yeah, all right. I always felt like, you know, you're, well, I'll take your money. Here's your comic. Thank you for shopping with us. I'll come again. But at the same time, I always thought, who is this person? And, and I, I, I like, you ever have this moment where you cannot identify with a person you're talking to on like a very primitive, like base level? Like I, I you and I are nothing alike. I don't, I just, I don't know what to say, but generally speaking, uh, there is comics are written for people. I don't believe that comics are just written for no one with the possible exception of Iron Man 2020. I, I cannot for the life of me figure out who that comic is written for other than maybe people who don't like comics. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't know I, that one. I have no answer for, but gen I'm, I'm being a little tongue in cheek. I, I mean, it's for people who are dumb. That's who it's for. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding again. I'm kidding. Again. It, it's for, <laughs> it's, for, it's, it's for people who, uh, don't want to think too much about their comics and just want to have a light breezy adventure that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, but they want to feel kind of smart while they're reading it. So they wanted to have techie terms. That, that's, that's the best I can come up with. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, I, I think that, it's important for us as either retailers or fans or critics or whatever we might be to recognize, yes, comics are written for someone. And the fastest we, the, you know, the faster we can ascertain who this comic is written for, maybe it's written for, you know, some completely different audience. It's not us. And therefore it's easy for us to avoid. Great. 
uh, maybe it's written for you and you recognize you're not part of the mainstream. And there, there's people out there who still buy Nickelback songs on iTunes and download them and pay for that stuff. There's, there's still people out there who do that. Now, th- those aren't good people, but they they do exist and, and money can be made. So you just got to find that audience, tap into it. By the way, it's a whole other discussion point of should comics be written for everyone if the everyone that they're writing toward is, represents such a tiny market that the comic isn't financially, you know, sustainable. Yeah, that that's a good that's a good question, and and the answer is no. <laughs> but um, that that you know, it's not like the comics being written for no one. It's just being written for a market that doesn't exist, yeah, and that that's a that's a key difference. Anyway, what do you think? Are comics written for nobody at times? Is uh, what's an example of a comic that you know you see it? It's out there. You recognize it's for an audience, just not you. Uh, what's an example of that? Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think, uh, your opinions on the topic, all that kind of fun stuff. Like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications if you want to be notified. Follow me on social media. But most importantly of all, thanks for listening.